Israel remarried. Listen to me. When she became a widow. And isn't that exactly what we're already told? I don't know if you caught it or not, but that's why I wanted to read the second witness to Judah's divorce in Isaiah 54. Listen to it again. Isaiah 54, 4 and 5. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the, na- the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood. That's why this isn't talking about just her, be- her 70 year p- putting away. He says, you will no longer remember the reproach of thy widowhood, for thy maker is thine husband, Yahweh of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. There's your second witness. Who was it who died? Yahshua once again had to somehow, can we explain it? No. And when we try to explain the infinite with the finite mind, we get ourselves in trouble. This is something, brethren and sisters, you're just going to have to accept by faith. It's an infinite concept our mind simply cannot explain. The Trinitarian doctrine may be a good human approach to it, but I will not embrace it because we can't fully explain it. We can't understand it, let alone explain it. But somehow, he had to be Yahweh, and it has to be accepted by faith. Or a part of Yahweh had to be in Yeshua, since only Yahweh, only Yahweh the husband, could make Israel a widow. And except in Yahshua, Yahweh never died. There's so much more to the story of of his death, burial, and resurrection than we're being told. Than any of us have been told, most of us, at least in the past. Consequently, through Yahshua's death and resurrection, Yahweh's remarriage to Israel was made possible. Remarriage to an adulterous wife? No to a born-again virgin. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Would to God, Paul writes, you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I espouse you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. A chaste virgin, a born again. He made not only by the resurrection of Yeshua the Christ, he not only made himself then available as a new creation, if you will, as a new husband to be able to remarry the divorced wife, but through that he also, as we all understand, also made it possible for, the, for his people to once again become virgin, or at least a remnant of his people to do so, through the blood-soaked sacrifice of, his, of Yeshua. But now someone may want to respond to that by saying, yeah, but weren't the, the Corinthians non-Israelite Gentiles? No, they were not. They were Gentilized Israelites. You say, how do you know that? Well, amongst other ways, consider 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, and I know I'm just reading and quoting a lot of these, but there's a lot in this message, and we need to cover this, the, cover the, get this covered. But consider 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2, especially the, one, the little small word, our. Bruce McCarthy has gone around, and he says, you know, there's, there's so much importance in some of those little bitty words, and I think he even uses this passage as an example. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud. Who is he writing to? The Christians of Corinth. But he's saying, How all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were immersed under Moses in the cloud and the sea. I might point out here to you as well, Romans chapter 4 and verse 1, and if you use an NIV, I highly encourage you to get Pastor Brueggemann's uh, series on which Bible, which version and especially if it's the NIV, because I believe it has been a programmed version to take away what, we, what belongs to us. And if you go to Romans chapter 4, 1 in the King James New American Standard, you'll find that it talks about that even there with the Romans, he speaks of our father Abraham in the flesh. Read it in the NIV, they took out in the flesh. It's gone. And you can go back to the Greek, it should be there. But just like Romans, it was the Romans father Abraham in the flesh in that case and here as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 2 he speaks of our father the Corinthians father 2 Corinthians was written to the same genetic people as was 1 Corinthians and those to whom 1 Corinthians was written were identified as the offspring of those Israelites who were in the wilderness with Moses now I'm trying to bring this to a conclusion 
Have you ever thought about those words in conclusion? Those are meaningless. That's a meaningless term that only preachers use. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Trying to put this all together. In Matthew 21, 43, not only was the cessation of, the, of Yahweh's old covenant kingdom relationship with the house of Judah foretold by Yeshua, the cessation, not only was the cessation of that old covenant kingdom relationship with the house of Judah foretold by Yeshua, but so was the renewal of the kingdom with another nation. Matthew 21, 43 again, it says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you, the house of Judah, and given to a nation bringing the fruits thereof. Key word, nation bringing the fruits thereof. The Bible's always its own best commentary. Don't forget that. What, that. what the Bible has to explain what that means. Well, who or what was, is, or it was, or is that nation that God reestablishes his kingdom relationship with? Well, doesn't it stand to reason that it would be with those, or at least a remnant of those, with whom he previously had the same relationship with, whom he had divorced, and whom it is prophesied he would have it again with? Doesn't that just stand to reason? That it would be those same people, especially since that's what it's prophesied. That is, Israelites from both the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Of course it does. And here's the proof that that's exactly who it was. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. <clears throat> Verse 9, but ye, but ye, now stop right there. You can't go any further, can you, until you identify who the ye is that he's speaking about. We've got to know who the ye is that Peter is addressing, and the only way to, do, to know who that is is to go back to the beginning of the book and read whom Peter was writing to. So First Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua the Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, from just a surface reading of that very first verse of the first chapter of 1 Peter, most Christians, <laughs> regrettably that's about all that that verse is usually given by most Christians, is nothing but a surface reading. But from a surface reading, the only thing that can be ascertained is that Peter was writing his epistle to residents of Galatia, Cappadocia, and so forth. But I ask you, what kind of residents are we talking about here? Well, they're first identified as strangers. Peter, an apostle of Yeshua the Christ, to the strangers, which comes from the Greek word parapademos, which is defined by Strong's, listen carefully, as a resident stranger. And by Vine's expository dictionary of, Greek word, of, of New Testament Greek words as, quote, sojourning in a same, excuse me, sojourning in a strange place away from one's own people, end of quote. In other words, this word tells us that the people whom Peter was addressing were not genuine Galatians and Cappadocians and Bithynians, etc., but were in, instead non-genetic strangers who were simply re residing in those countries. So if they were not genetic Galatians, etc., who were they? The next word, 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua the Christ, to the strangers scattered... Scattered. The word scattered comes from the Greek word, many of you already know, I'm sure, diaspora. It's only three times used in the scriptures. The other two times very clearly applied to Israel. Diaspora, which Strong defines as, quote, Israelite residents in Gentile country. 